attributes of a good mother. The, some of the attributes of a good mother. I thank God for people that God has placed in our lives to talk to us to through their words, through their you know, through books, through their their ministries. One of them is Pastor Mrs. Oyedeko. She's my far far away mentor when it comes to family and children. And so of what I'm going to be talking about today, she taught me, you know, I, I, I'm a good, I'm a reader. I like to read and I have read so many of her books. When I went to Nigeria, I ordered a lot of her books. When uh, I see somebody going to Nigeria, I tell them, please help me get some of Mama's book because her life, as well as what she says, make me to me as a mother. She's, she's, you know, so I just want to honor her this afternoon among mothers. I also want to honor my, my spiritual mother, Prophetess Mabel Talabi. She instilled into me many, many of the things, of, of the attributes that, you know, mothers could have. I also honor my biological mother. I was missing her this morning. You know, I was thinking about her wisdom. She's 90 years old. But each time I talk to her, I can see wisdom in, 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 in her that well, I, I, I didn't see when I was growing up. I was like, you know, I thought I was wiser than her. You know, that's how children are to the parents. They will think that, you know, you don't know anything. But now, as I'm getting older, and she's getting older, I can see wisdom. I, I, I honor my mother. I miss her this morning. I was just praying that God elongates her life so I can see her again. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But I want to appreciate all of you mothers in the house as well. You are doing an awesome job. Great job. I want to tell you this morning that motherhood is a privilege committed to us by God. It's an awesome privilege. You know, some of a lot of us did not have to go through the time that um, Hannah went through looking for a child or Sarah. But let me tell you something, you carry that baby for nine months, that's a long time. The moment you find out that you are pregnant, it seems as if by the time you, especially when you are getting to the latter part, it seems as if it's been eternity. So you have done a good job. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you this afternoon that it takes understanding to make anything to be outstanding. For us to be, to bring up outstanding children, we must understand what motherhood means. It takes us to understand what God has for us, what God tells us, what God says to us on how to be good mothers, to bring out outstanding children. And the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus. Motherhood is not only carrying the pregnancy and delivering the child. There are other responsibilities. The responsibilities including nourishing, including training, and also inspiring the child. Hallelujah. And these are qualities that we must have. We must be able to train our children. We must be able to nourish our children. We must be able to inspire the children. Yes, mothers are born nourishers, but not all mothers are able to train children. Not all mothers are able to inspire children. Hallelujah. Especially a lot of mothers like us who come from Africa, it is difficult because we are set in our ways, but the Bible teaches us that we must inspire our children. Now we're going to talk about some of them this afternoon. To be a mother requires certain qualities and you can only give what you have. If, there are, if the qualities are lacking, you may not be able to give the qualities to our children or to be good mothers. In the book of Acts, when Peter went to the, to the beautiful gate, and the man was asking him to give him money or whatever, alms, whatever it is that he could give. Peter told him, he said, I have no gold or silver, but what I have, I will give to you. What you have is what you can only give. He had the name of Jesus, but there are some qualities that we must possess. And I know that a lot of us possess these qualities, but I want to bring out those qualities in you. I want to bring your eyes, your, your thoughts to those qualities so that you can begin to use them in our roles as mothers. Hallelujah. Life does not allow a vacuum. If we are not impacting or imparting our children positively, we are actually impacting or imparting them negatively. 
It is either we are doing it right or we are doing it wrong because there is no vacuum in life. As a mother, you are unique in every respect. You are unique in every respect. You are in a class of your own. You occupy a special place in the plan and the program of God. You are unique. That's why it is nonsense when people say they get married, man and man get married, and they are adopting children, and they are calling mommy, they are calling daddy, they are, you know, and you have not, they don't even know what it means to be a mother. Mothers are unique. Whether you are a biological mother, a foster mother, a spiritual mother, or even you are mother in waiting, you are unique. Hallelujah. Mothers are expected to play a motherly role to our husband. How many people agree with me? That is the expectation. The moment you get married, you start cooking for that man, just like you cook for your children. Some of them, you do their, you do their Lord. Some of them, you may have to wash them. Some of the men. You know, bathe for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we play that role. The Bible tells us that when Rebecca got married to Isaac, Rebecca took the place of Isaac's mother. The Bible told us in verse 67 of, uh, of Genesis, I think chapter 24, that Rebecca comforted Isaac after his mother passed away. Because Rebecca came with the intuition of a mother. That's who we are. When we step into our husband's house, we take over. We become their mamas. They can't do anything without us. Hallelujah. So we play a good role of a mother to our husbands, and then after that to our children. Like I said, either our biological, our foster, or our spiritual children. We play motherly roles to them. But a position without function is mockery. If you don't know your function, they call you mother, you get back, and there is no function as a mother, there is, it is mockery. So if they call you a mother, we as mothers must have what it takes to be exemplary mothers. Our mission as mothers is to raise the next generation. And my question to you this afternoon is, what will be said of you by your children? While you are still on earth, or maybe after you have long been gone, what would your children say about you? The Bible talks about the woman in Proverbs chapter 31 that the, her children rise up and call her blessed. May your children rise up and call you blessed. In the mighty name of Jesus. After you are long gone, may they remember you for your good life with them. In the name of Jesus. There's a woman long ago, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She was married to a man who went about preaching, going on missionary journeys, but she stayed at home, taking care of her six children. And she would pour herself into them. At the end of her life, she said, I, was never, I never held a microphone to be a pastor or to be a preacher. I never went on missionary journey. But I took my time to pour the word of God into these children. She had six children and she had six days that she would use to pour herself into each of her children. John and Charles Wesley became the founders of the Methodist Church. And they called that woman the Methodist mother. At the end of their lives, at the end of it all, John and Charles Wesley Began, began to talk about their mother, that what they were at that time was because of, the, of their mother. What would your children say about you after you are long gone? The mother of George Washington, the first president of the United States of America, said that all I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. He came out to say that. I want you to begin to think about your life today. 
What would your children say about you after you are long gone? And the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus. So in essence of that, I want to talk to us about three attributes of a good mother. Come with me to Genesis chapter 24. I'm going to read verses 1 to 14. Genesis 24 verses 1 to 14. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you don't take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed. For all his master's goods were in his hands. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahal. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water. At evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O oh Lord, God of my master, Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master, Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will give unto your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Verse 14. Oh, okay. Is that verse 14? Hallelujah. Anyway, so this is Eliezer. He was an 80-year-old man by this time, according to Bible history, going to run errand for his, for his master. His master had told him to go and look for a wife, for Isaac, his only son. And this, all we read was a conversation that they had. But Isaac... Uh, 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 Eliezer, when he got there, he needed to to know exactly what quality, what what exactly do, do, do I do? What would this woman be? How would she be? What would she look like? And uh, looking at this scripture, we found some attributes that he pulled out, and every one of them. If you read further in that scripture, every one of them Rebecca met. Because as soon as Rebecca came out, as soon as she came there, she did everything that Eliezer asked. And much more. Looking for further down in the scripture, we found out that there are these three things were shown in her life. These three attributes. She was a beautiful woman. She had she was a role model to her children and to her husband. And also, she supported the vision of her husband and her mother. But I want us to go through each of these things. There's another woman in the Bible that we want to talk about regarding beautiful women. Her name was Abigail. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 1 to 3, 1 Samuel, then Samuel died and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Mon whose business was in Carmel and the man was very rich. He had three 
thousand sheep and a thousand goats, and was sharing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Neba, and the name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was something else. Hallelujah. We don't want to talk about the man. Uh, by the grace of God, I just published my first book, and one of the chapters in that book is Abigail. Abigail, you know, talking about people who have attributes for, for driving into destiny. Abigail, I titled it Abigail, Beauty and Brains. She was a beautiful woman, but her beauty was not only of the outside. The beauty of a woman, the attribute beauty of a woman, or the attribute of the beauty of a woman, is not just outside, it's inner beauty. Your beauty and worth are from the inside, regardless of how much makeup you can put on. You could look beautiful on the outside, but your beauty must be from the inside. The book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. How do we become a good mother? We must be beautiful. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Verse 2. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. 3. Do not let your adornment be merely from outside. Arranging, let me finish now. <laughs> Arranging of the hair. Wearing of gold or putting on of, of fine apparel. He's not saying that you should go back to verse 3 so that we don't. Verse 2. Uh, no, verse 3. Let it. Verse 3, sorry. I know once you press that thing, it doesn't let you stop. Do not let your adornment be merely. It doesn't say don't adorn yourself. Don't let it stop there. Not just because you have nice hair or you put on beautiful gold or you are putting on nice dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. That is the inner beauty that God is talking about. With the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Another translation said a meek spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. One attribute of a good mother is inner beauty. The beauty that comes from what you have inside of you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Your beauty must radiate from the inside. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. 1 Corinthians 3 18. 1 Corinthians 3 18. Let no one no, that's not the one I'm looking for. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. I believe it is. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. We get transformed from inside out. I want, I want you to agree with me that if you see a good mother who is who has an inner beauty it's only a matter of time you begin to see them looking beautiful on the outside even if they were not beautiful before but once you begin to pour the word of God inside yourself and you get the word into yourself more and more you begin to find yourself looking appearing more beautiful that even if you put on anything it suits you very well because we are being transformed from inside out. Our inner beauty is the most important beauty that we should go after. This beauty is called meekness. It's a teachable beauty. Depending on the spirit of God. It depends on God and makes you to present yourself to God empty and waiting to be filled. So a woman, a mother... Who wants to change, the, who wants to make a, 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 a difference in the life of their children must go after the inner beauty. When you are meek, you won't need to fret like many mothers do today. You begin to look beautiful on the inside, on the outside.
from the inside. It takes meekness and a quiet spirit to submit to your husband like Sarah did. She submitted to Abraham even when Abraham had no clue where he was going. Abraham just told her, let's go. God showed me somewhere. Where? I don't know, but we just want to go. It takes meekness to be able to submit like that. Following him to an unknown land. Meekness means that we show patience and humility. It means that we are submissive. It means that we are gentle. It means that we are modest. Inner beauty is submissive. Inner beauty is modest. And these are the things that our children need from us as mothers. Meekness means to be constantly willing to learn and to be bendable. We must be bendable. We must be willing to listen to our children. We must be willing to listen to our husbands. We must be willing to listen to God, most importantly, and change some things in our lives. The Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus. The second part of the, of the beauty that this woman that I talked about, Abigail, and as well as uh, Rebecca had, was being physical beauty. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, Genesis 1, 31, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right, let's go to the next one. Thus the heaven and the earth were made. So in chapter 2, he made the woman. But what my point here is that after he had made everything that was good, he found out that there was something that was missing, even out of what was good. And then he created the woman. The woman came from perfection already. Because whatever God had made was good. And after he saw all that he had made that was good, he saw that there was something that was missing. And then he needed to create the perfect one. Sisters, let me tell you, you are perfect. You were created perfect. Don't allow anybody who has no way to go to tell you that you are not good. Don't allow anybody that has no knowledge of what the word of God says that you are not perfect. When God created you, he took extra time to do you. He took extra time and he created you perfect. You owe no man or any woman apology for your life. You don't owe anybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We come from a premise of perfection. And our end result is perfect. Women were created to further beautify the creation of God. When God made Adam, he finished, he was okay with Adam. But Adam needed somebody to help him. Let me tell you something. There's somebody here that needs to hear this. You don't need anyone to help you. You are created to be a help for somebody. So don't sit around and say, hey, my husband, he walked out on me. So I'm helpless. You are not helpless. You are not helpless. Actually, there are two people in the Bible that the, that the Lord called helpers. You are one of them. The other person is the Holy Spirit. After you, it is the Holy Spirit. Or after the Holy Spirit is you. So don't let anybody make you feel like, well, uh, you know, we're gonna walk, I'm going to, I'm going to just leave you uh, because of this. Because no, 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 no. You, you have the helper inside of you, and you are a help. See yourself as a help. That's what I tell women. See yourself as a help. Be a value to somebody. Be a value to your husband. Be a value to your to, to your children. Don't just sit down and say, hey, because of this, because of that, I'm, I can't do anything. Yes, you can. Women are an epitome of beauty. Wherever a woman is found, beauty must be evident. Do you know why they use uh, women to advertise? Eh? You want to buy water, you see a woman wearing bikini. Because women are supposed to signify beauty. The moment you look at that woman, you will get thirsty. You want to drink that water. So, they, so you are thinking, oh, that's the problem. And then they hand you the water and you drink it. That is, that is why they provide, that is why the advertisers provide it now. Because women are very good to behold. You are beautiful. You are 
beautiful. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Your outer beauty must be an expression of your inner beauty. Otherwise, it becomes vain. A lot of women are vain. They don't know, they don't acknowledge their inner beauty and they just go around with the outer beauty. They put everything on the outer, you know, but you know, you may look beautiful, but if somebody said that uh, an ugly woman inside, it may look beautiful, but let them open their mouth. You will know that they are ugly. But our beauty, our outer beauty must be an expression of our inner beauty. Sarah was so beautiful that Adam, uh, that Abraham needed to, to find a way to stay alive. He had to lie. He, she was so beautiful. You know when they went, when there was, uh, when there was famine, and they went down, and, they, and he had to tell Sarah to tell uh, Abimelech that uh, uh, she, she, she was his sister. She was so beautiful. And she was not a young chick at that time. But because of what she had inside of her. The same thing with Isaac. Isaac had to do the same thing with Rebecca. He also had to lie. But he only was serious because after he lied, then he couldn't keep his hands off of her. That's how he was caught. He lied, he said, she's my sister. But then, after a while, the king now saw them romancing. Because she was so beautiful, he's like, you know what? I don't care what happens. I'm just going to keep touching you. Hallelujah. The secret of your external beauty is the inner beauty that you must have. God placed beauty in you. Let your beauty find expression. Let the God in you shine through your beauty. Enhance it if needed. You know, the makeup we put on, the wigs and all that, they are beauty enhancement. If, if you need to enhance it, as a woman, you enhance it, but handle it very well. A beauty that is not properly handled leads to object of sin. The, what I mean by this is, as a mother, we want to enhance our beauty, but we don't want to be flirting around. We don't want to be dressing provocatively. I tell women, I said, this one that you are wearing is supposed to be in your bedroom. You, you shouldn't, this, this is, you know, brother, no, not you, anyway, none, none of you, none of you, right? so that nobody will be saying, oh, his wife is doing, this is brother Thomas's property that you are exposing now. Hallelujah. As mothers, we must guard our beauty. We, we must make sure that our beauty is bringing out what we want our children to look like. The third one is environmental beauty. As women, we bring beauty to our homes, we bring beauty to the church and to the community. That is the reason you find out that the flowers that are being made in the church are being made by women. Because a woman walks into the church, they look around, oh, flower, oh, the carpet is nice, oh, the home. That's why our the people that clean the church, most of them are women because it is in it for us to bring beauty into our environment. What does this mean? It means that the environment that we need to raise our children must be clean environments. It must be a beautiful environment. Wherever we are as women, the beauty in us must be reflected. A keeper in the book of Titus chapter 2 verses 3 to 5, Titus chapter the older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine or any wine at all, teachers of good women, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, and to be discreet, chaste homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, homekeepers, another translation says, we must be chaste homekeepers. Keeper at home means that you have charge and you take care of your home. A good mother takes care of her home. There is no excuse to be sloppy. There is no excuse that your house will, you people will come to your house and that will, it looks as if Afghanistan war has just ended there. Our children are not supposed to be liabilities. Once you have children, you say, oh, it's because of my children. And you have toys all over the house. A man can pass in your house. Can't walk around in your house. That is not what we're supposed to teach our children. We teach our children. My children know me. I tell them, one, one thing that makes me so happy, if you ask one of them, is a clean house. 
the house must be clean. If, if there is no reason why you will be living in a home with cockroaches, that you'll be looking for who to evict one another. Is either the cockroach evicts you or you evict the cockroach? Our houses must be clean. We must bring our children up in clean environments. They must learn that cleanliness, according to the word we say, is next to godliness. It's not in the Bible, but it's something that is good. Hallelujah. Our children are assets. They are not liabilities. So we should not blame them for our uncleanness. Ah, it's you. You threw the toy out. Uh, your clothes are on the floor. It's old. It's this child. No, they can't pick up after themselves. Train them from the beginning. They will pick up after themselves. Train them. Show them how to do it. That's our responsibility as mothers. Hallelujah. Yeah. Your children will adapt to every environment. If you teach them to be tidy, they will be. It's what you teach that child that he or she will be. The woman are in Proverbs chapter 31. Despite being busy, she was still able to keep her home tidy. If you look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 27, Proverbs 31, she watches over the ways of her household and she does not eat the bread of idleness. She watches over the ways of her household. I know we are busy. We go to work, we do this, we do that, but hey, God has given us the strength. We can do it. We can do it. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Spare, spend your spare time wisely. Rather than sitting on the phone and be talking all the time or watching Nollywood endless movie that they don't have beginning or the end. And you know, rather than doing that, just pick up something in the house. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. The second thing that we are as women, or the second attribute that we must possess is the attribute of a role model. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Timothy, let no one despise for you, but be an example. We must be an example to people, to our children. We must be examples to our husbands. We must be role models to our husbands. You are a role model to your children, whether you like it or not, to your husband as well. The 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that we just read. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. 1 Peter 3. One to two. Wives, be submissive to your husband, and even if some do not obey the word, but they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. We are role model, whether we like it or not, we are role model to our husbands. We are role model to our children. When, when my daughter was younger, she was, I mean, she still hangs out with me, but she was always hanging out with, with me then. So when I was praying, you know, some prayers that you would pray, I would be walking around in our house, you know, opening Bible and, and very soon you see queen following me. And then the way my head is moving, her whole head will be moving too, because that's what they do. That's what they see. I'm a role model to her. And sometimes it could be very challenging, <laughs> you know, to be role models. But God has given us, we are, we are, whether we like it or not. A lot of you women, you are like that. You know that your children will do what you do. So we are role models to them. We, a role model charts the course, sets the pace, and sets examples for others to follow. You are a role model to your children. If you curse, your children will curse. If you gossip, your children will start gossiping. If you lie, your children will start lying. If you steal, they will do it. So we have to be careful. There's a lot of responsibility on us as women. There must be words that must not come out of your mouth. There must be places that you must not go as a mother. There must be things that you must do. They must see you do some things. And I will talk about that very soon. The last thing is the attribute, the last attribute is that you are a vision supporter. You support the book of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Every child born into this world was born with a vision and a purpose. They're not just to be counted among the numbers. They are supposed to be outstanding. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nation. That is each and every one of your child, children. Each and every one of them. That is who they 
are. Before they were born, God already knew who they would be. So we, as the vessels that God used to bring them out, we support that vision. That means that we channel them a right to the vision. Hallelujah. The mother, and this is not just uh, for biological mothers only. Foster mothers, spiritual mothers. The woman that brought uh, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the one that brought Moses up, you know she took him at the stream, at the river, and brought him up. Do you know that if she was not a good foster mother, Moses probably would not have fulfilled his destiny. Because first of all, she would not have allowed his mother to come and take care of him in the Jewish way. And second of all, he would not, she would not have put him into a good school where he would learn, you know, to have good understanding. Third of all, when he was going to meet the other Jewish people, she would not have allowed him. But she was good. She contributed to his destiny. So who am I talking to? You don't need to be a biological mother to influence somebody. You could influence anyone that God has brought to you to be a mother to them. We are, so we support their vision. Every one of our children have, has a purpose in life. We must support the vision that God has given to them. We believe in them. We be their cheerleaders. My mom, my, my spiritual mother, she has turned to our cheerleader now. She tells us, she says, I'm your cheerleader. Because we ride on her shoulders. She, we, we have visions now. Each of our spiritual children, we have our own different visions now. Some of us are going into, into, into humanitarian. Some are going into apostolic ministry. Some are going into prophetic. But she cheers us on. She cheers us on. And the same thing we are to our children. I cheer my children on. Recently, my daughter was telling me something about what she dreams to do. At first, I thought, ah, really? You want to do that? And I said, then I thought about it. I said, yeah, you can actually do it. You can change. Because at first I saw it as a negative thing. But then I began to see that, well, I have put so much into you. That I know that when you start doing this thing, you're going to be gathering people that will follow the right path. And I said, go for it. The same thing with our son. When he decided to choose a career, I didn't understand the career. I have no clue. But then I said, well, this is what you love to do. I'm going to be your cheerleader. I will cheer you on. Because from the beginning, we have put the word of God into them. Hallelujah. We must cheer them on, but we must be their humble monitors. We monitor them. We make sure that they are going right in the way that they're supposed to do. Help and equip them for the purpose that God created them for. We must make spiritual contributions into their lives. We must always be ready to counsel them because we support the vision that God has given unto them. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. There are three quick weapons that I want to talk about that we can use, that we can get and use as effective mothers. The Lord will help us. Matthew chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. I'm going to talk to us from the story of this woman. The three weapons are the weapons of prayer, Weapon of faith and the weapon of wisdom. And behold, a man of Canaan, another translation said she's a man from Syrophoenicia, came from that region and cried out to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word. He didn't say anything to her prayer, he didn't answer her prayer. And his disciples came, insult upon injury and said to him, send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their masters. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that hour. This was a woman that had these three characteristics. She was a prayerful woman, she was a woman of faith, and she was a woman of wisdom. She prayed to God. The first one, she, she cried to God. And then the first verse. And then another verse, she said, Lord, help me. 
Prayer is very important. We must be women of prayer. For us to be able to do anything with our children in this world that they are, we must be prayerful. We must always be on the knees, always praying for our children. Whether young or old, those of us who have grandchildren, we must pray for them. Prayer is very important. To be a mother is to know the prayer of uh, the place of prayer over our children and over our, uh, our family. We must be able to solve the issues of our children in prayer. As old as my prayer and my children are now, I still pray over them. When they were younger, I would touch them on the head, but they don't want to be touched anymore. So I will go to their room when they are sleeping. Katorobo Shata. You must make it. I will go there, walk out before they wake up. By the time they wake up, they find out that they are dreaming good dreams. We pray for our children. When my son went to first time, when he first went to university, because every morning we will pray. Before, when he was in high school, if up to now we do it every morning, we pray before we leave the home. So when he started, first started university, I will send his own prayer. I cover him with the blood of Jesus. Every morning I will send him. So after about a few weeks, he still not sent a message. He said, Mommy, I think you need to stop doing that now. <laughs> You know, like, okay, I don't think we need to keep on doing this every morning that you'll be sending me. I cover you with the blood. I, I was like, oh, I'm hurt. Why? But I still do it. I don't send it to him, but I will do it. As I'm covering the rest, putting my hands, I put my hands on them every morning before they leave that house. I cover you with the blood of Jesus. There will be no incident in your school. Your school is surrounded by the blood of Jesus. Mothers must pray for their children. I tell them, I say, which other job do I have? And not only my biological children, by the grace of God, I have a foster son that is living with us, that Lola. I pray for him. By the grace of God, I have spiritual children. And I pray for you all. I have a list that I pray every time. And I have some troublesome one that I have to, once, not one, once, that I have to pray for every day. That God just help me with this one. If you can just help me with this one, it is good. Hallelujah. They know themselves. <laughs> you know, there was a time pastor was meeting for a couple in my office. Now, let me tell you one story. One thing. If you are met in pastor's office, you are good. Yes. But at the time you get to pastor this office, you are in that is, they call it the judiciary room. <laughs> that is the room that you don't want to come to. Because some of them will sit behind the door so that people will not see them. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you have not been to my office and been sat down in my office, you are doing very well. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you have been to my office, you have learned. <laughs> I hope you don't come back. <laughs> Glory be to God. Children like that, that we may need to make extra prayers for, that we may need to bring to the judicial room in the place of prayer. That is the throne of God. Constantly bringing them. The more you spend time praying for your children, the less time you spend on the phone talking to a lawyer about them. The less time you spend talking to a, 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 a juvenile facility or an adult facility officer, I don't know what they call them about them. The less time you talk to doctors or mental health workers about them because of a, 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 a substance abuse and addiction. Spend time. And by the grace of God, next Saturday, what are we doing? We're coming together. This is I believe so much. God has called us to pray for our children. We're coming together again. We do it every three months. Or maybe if God tells us to do it within that time, we'll come together, pray for our children. And we have been seeing results. I'm seeing them entering universities, seeing them getting scholarships. Hallelujah. So let us pray for our children. Your prayer does not have to be eloquent or long, but must be word based. What do you want your child to be? You have a vision of what your child needs to be. You begin to declare it. Hallelujah. And as you speak it, do you know there is a prayer in the scripture that is called the prayer of the breast and the womb? Those prayers, they don't go unanswered. Because it is a prayer that comes from inside of inside of you. And you pray it, it is word based. You pray it over your children. You learn to pray in tongues a lot for your children. Because the Bible tells us that sometimes we don't know what to pray about. But the Holy Spirit helps 
helps us in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 26. He helps us to pray. So you go around, rap toko, every time I remember my children, especially the one that is far away from me, because I don't know. You know, we bring them house for, we bring them up well, but we don't know what the devil is planning. So I bust into tongues when I remember them. I pray in tongues over them. Hallelujah. The second weapon is the weapon of faith. Matthew, the text in Matthew, verse 20, 28, verse 28. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. She was a woman of faith. She had a bulldog faith. A faith that does not let go. The bulldog faith is a faith that you clench into, you hold on to. And that is the faith of a mother. The faith of a godly mother. You see something wrong going on and you just use faith. You declare what you want that child to be. Hallelujah. Fervent faith. That woman refused to give up. That is, the, that is the reason she had a hotline to the throne of God. She was not a woman that was in covenant. She was not a woman in covenant. She was a Canaanite woman. Canaanites were Gentiles. But she got God's attention because of her faith. We must be women of faith. We must refuse to give up over our children. Faith does not declare what it sees. Faith declares what he wants to look like. Your child may not be what you want that child to look like right now. Your child may not be getting all the A's and B's that you expect, but declare in faith. You are excellent. You are better than your equals. You are greater than the ones that you hang out with. You begin to declare those things. And as you declare, you begin to see changes in the lives of your children. In the name of Jesus. We must build our faith from hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. Your faith is also built from testimonies. Listen to testimonies of people. Listen to, don't, don't get upset when people are sharing the testimony of how God has used them to bring up their children. Anchor to it. Get hold of it. And that is the reason you need to be careful who you listen to. You don't want to listen to people whose children, they are, they, all they are talking about is, oh, how bad my children are. Listen to the ones that have made it. And your faith will be built up. Your relationship with God must be firm. Hallelujah. The just shall live by their own faith. Your faith must be genuine. And your faith must be transferable to your children. They must see you living out your faith. They must see you believing God for things and standing on faith, not real faith, just like that of Louise and Eunice for Timothy. Real faith, standing faith, faith that does not waver. And the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus. And the last one is the weapon of wisdom. In this house, what are we called? The women of the book of Matthew chapter 15, verse, the, that, verse 23 and verse 26. But he answered her not a word. If it was you and I, you went to pastor. Pastor, mm, this is what is going on in my life. Oh. I don't have this, I don't have this child. Something is wrong with this child. And pastor is just... Pastor did not answer you. What would you do? Forget you, Joe. I'm leaving. I'm going to go find somebody else. I'm going to another church. This church, you're too this, you're too that. But the Bible said he didn't answer a word. And then to add insult to injury, Jesus' disciples now came and said to him, Send her away now. What is she looking for? Useless woman. She's crying out of us. She's not even in covenant. The ones that are in covenant, we have not finished handling them. How about the ones that are outside of the covenant? And she's asking all these questions. But look at the, 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 the next verse. Verse 26. Verse 20, look at verse 26. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. But she answered in wisdom. She didn't get upset to go, to leave. She answered. Verse 27. And she said, Yes, Lord, in humility, wisdom. Yet, even the dogs eat the crumbs. The Bible says, 
a gentle answer turns away wrath. She was gentle. Wisdom will give you ability to speak gently. Wisdom will give you ability to respond in a good way, even when people are talking to you in a bad way. When your children or somebody is acting out to you, a woman of wisdom will not go like that. And this is a woman of wisdom. She had every reason to give up and curse Jesus and his disciple. But she asked, she acted wisely. A wise woman builds a home. It is wisdom that will build our home. A mother must be wise in their words and in their action. If there is one prayer that I pray every time, is Lord, give me wisdom. I need wisdom. I need wisdom to do what I need to do. I need wisdom to be a mother to my children. I need wisdom to be a mother to my spiritual children. We must always ask for wisdom. What's either build up or tear down? Be careful of what we speak over our children. We must be careful. Wisdom is what we need so that we don't, when they offend us, we don't curse them. Because some of those children, they will frustrate you. They will push limits, let's so to say. It is wisdom that will help us to be quiet. I will not curse you. I will not say anything bad over you. Mothers need wisdom to raise godly children in this debased world. People must be able to drink from our fountain of wisdom. Your wisdom must attract people to you. What do you think? Mom, what do you think? You must be your children's counselor. Your children should not be looking for other people to help them to counsel. And how do you get wisdom? From the word of God. Asking God for wisdom. In the book of James, it says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God. The Lord will give us wisdom in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your wisdom be available for your children and the Lord will help you in the name of Jesus. Now, finally, have you made any mistake in motherhood? I have made mistakes. I have done things that were not right. But the Bible says that we should instruct, we should receive instruction from God's mouth. We should lay his words in our hearts. We should remind, we should return to the Almighty God and we will be built up in Job chapter 22, verses 23 to 25. Today, if you come to him, there is hope for you. If you decide that today I want to make this right, this is a new course in my life. I'm starting a new journey as a mother, even though my children are grown, even, I, even though I'm a, grand, I'm a grandmother, but you are here today so you can do it right. God gathers us together so he can teach us. The prodigal son, when he found out that he did it wrong, he came back home, he came back to his senses. Today, I'm coming back to my senses. I'm doing things right. Is there anything that I have not been doing right? Are there any of these attributes that we have talked about that I need to make right? Today is the day that you will begin to make right and the Lord will help you in the name of Jesus. I pray for you today, you will not fail. You will be a living example for generations to follow in the name of Jesus. You will have peace over your children in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, mother, you shall not labor in vain over your children in the mighty name of Jesus. You will no longer suffer shame over your children. You will make impacts into generations in the mighty name of Jesus. If there is any single mother here today, there will be no more shame for you. No more reproach. No more grief. No more sorrow in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. If there is anyone battling with difficult children, receive wisdom for breakthrough. Receive wisdom for steps that you will take in the mighty name of Jesus. I break every manipulation of the devil over your children in the name of Jesus. The devil has no part over our children. He will not have any hand in our children's lives in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for potential mothers. Be fruitful. Be fruitful in the name of Jesus. I break every barrier against your fruitfulness in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare over you each and every one that is a mother that is coming in you. I declare over you this afternoon that your destiny will not be aborted. In the name of Jesus, your children will indeed rise up and call you blessed. Your grandchildren will look around you and say you are a blessed grandmother. In the name of Jesus, the Lord Almighty will reward you. All 
your neighbor of love, love over your children, they will not go in vain. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We glorify your name. We exalt you, Lord. You are the best mother. We thank you for all that you have given unto us. We thank you for the grace that you have imparted into us. We thank you for your word that you have sent for. I receive mine. I take my correction. And I pray that your other children will take our corrections. In the name of Jesus. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.